Uh, so this morning we're going to be getting into uh, the theology of friendship. In the future, hopefully, uh, we're going to be live streaming the entire service. So right now, during this COVID-19 pandemic quarantine time frame of social distancing, all that kind of stuff, you just have to deal with me standing up here and speaking. But we're going to get into this morning, and it'll probably be a four-part series of the theology of friendship. And this is a second message series that was kind of spawned from our series going through the book of John, the previous one, the Holy Spirit series. And if you, if you go to our YouTube channel, all those messages are there. All the videos that we did are there, so you can see that series. But that message series came from something I was reading in John, and I was like, we should really think about this and talk about this. This same series, or this next series, also came from John because of what Jesus was saying about his friends, the disciples, and how Jesus lived with them in friendship, and this idea of friendship that I think is kind of lost on our culture and our generation, and this deeper meaning behind this gift of friends and what friendship really is in this relationship God is offering. And maybe we're getting a little taste of that more than we used to because of having to be separated from our friends and not being able to be with them and do the normal things that we usually do with friends. So maybe we're, we're beginning to understand a little bit of how important these friendships are to our life and what God intends to do with friendship. So that's what we're going to be talking about uh, this morning. Before I do that, I'm going to open up with some prayer. I do want to just share a prayer request that I got yesterday. Uh, Lynn Bodenberg went to the Reading Hospital because of some chest pains. They did a bunch of tests uh, at the hospital. Everything came back negative. They're not sure what's going on. Lynn's going to go for a stress test tomorrow, and he's just asking if we'd be praying for him, uh, for Judy, and just that they'd be able to figure out what's going on. If you remember, Lynn did have some heart issues uh, years before and uh, is just trying to figure out exactly what's going on. So please be in prayer for, for Lynn as he has that a stress test tomorrow, and for the doctors to figure that out. So before we begin, let's open uh, with some prayer. Lord God, I am thankful for uh, the opportunity to be with Grace Church family, even though it's still in this virtual format. God, I am glad for technology to be able to even do this, and I'm thankful for those who continue to support the ministry of Grace Church uh, without that support, we wouldn't be able to do something like this. All this stuff costs money and time and energy from people, and I'm thankful that we have generous people here at Grace Church who believe in uh, what you've called us to do as, as Grace Church. This mission you've called us to be on with you, Lord, hasn't stopped because of a, a virus, Lord, but continues, and I'm thankful that we can still uh, be faithful to that mission because of the, the faithful support of so many people here at Grace Church. God, I am thankful for our church family, looking forward to getting back together uh, soon, Lord, and we just want to pray for Lynn this morning as he has that stress test tomorrow. We pray that it would reveal some conclusive results ex of exactly what's going on with his chest pains, and, and if there's any heart issues, Lord, I pray that you'd be with him as he undergoes that, Lord. I pray that you'd be with the doctors reading those tests, and Lord, that you would reveal something to them to help Lynn get this all sorted out. God, I too want to just ask that you'd be with us. I pray that your Holy Spirit, who can be here with me and with every member of Grace Church and with every son and daughter of yours, Lord, that's the gift that we have received through Jesus, this Holy Spirit, that your presence is with us, Lord. And we ask for your presence now as we begin to just open your word again and just look at this idea of friendship and, and uh, how I, I do believe, Lord, that's an important part of us flourishing as human beings. And so, God, we're thankful for the gift of friendship. Maybe we've had the opportunity to reconnect with some friends because of this and doing some Zoom calls or whatever. Uh, but, Lord, I pray that this uh, message series would just deepen the friendships we already have. And if we don't have those, Lord, that we would uh, seek them out because of uh, how fulfilling they can be in our lives. So, God, we just give this time over to you and ask your Holy Spirit to do with it as he will. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so we're going to be uh, kind of jumping around a little bit again in, in Scripture because of the type of message series it is. It is more topical 
in that uh, we're looking at this idea of friendship. It's going to be scattered throughout Scripture. Uh, after this message series, I'm planning a, another uh, sermon or two, I'm not sure, just trying to uh, address some of the things we see happening in our world today. Uh, I'm sure you've been praying, and we'll pray at the end of this uh, message for our country and just everything that's been taking place. And uh, July 5th message and the one uh, following that will, uh, or the July 5th message for sure, will be just trying to address some of those things uh, from a biblical perspective. Uh, but So we'll be jumping around a little bit, but over the summer we're going to do another deep dive into a book of the Bible like we did with the book of John. We're going to do that again with the book of Daniel in the Old Testament. Daniel being one of the prophets who's got a lot of some apocalyptic stuff he's talking about and then just some stories about him and his friends and how they lived within this empire that had engulfed the world. And so we're going to be doing a little bit closer look in the book of Daniel through the summer. This message series will be four-part and then we'll have a few other ones in July and towards the end of July we'll We'll talk about the book of Daniel specifically. So this morning, we've got a couple of uh, scriptures I want to look at and highlight, uh, beginning, of course, in Genesis, as we understand the theology of friendship. Where does the idea even come from? And I want to suggest to you that in the very beginning of Genesis, God is already setting this up. And we talked about this a little bit, if you remember, about a million years ago when we did the Family Project. And we talked about this idea of relationship and the importance of that. Um, And I'm going to highlight that again. John 15, 15 is where I kind of got this idea of what Jesus was really doing with the disciples and this idea of friendship. And I didn't put it on the screen. If you're looking at the the PowerPoint screen, there's actually just one or a few verses in the book of Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 18. Uh, where it talks about David and Jonathan and their relationship and their friendship. And you've got to read the whole, the, the entirety of the book of Samuel. There's 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel to understand what that friendship looked like. But we're going to highlight uh, chapter 18. So to start, and I was concerned moving back into the sanctuary because I didn't know where I was going to put my coffee. So I did bring a stand up here. Maybe you can see it. I don't know if you can see it online. I'm just going to take a sip. I was concerned about that. That might be a new feature in our when you when we all come back together in our uh, in gathering uh, physically together. Maybe I'll just have this. I'll just set this up here because I'm so used to it now. It's going to be three months I've been doing this where I've been opening my Bible, sharing the Word, and drinking coffee. So we're going to probably stick with that. So here's what I want you to do. Maybe you're watching this on your handheld device right here. And maybe you know this already. I don't know if you do. Do you know how many Facebook friends you have? Go onto your Facebook. Maybe you can't do this because you're watching. Do this later. But just look and see how many Facebook friends you have. Facebook tells me I've got 515 friends. I just didn't know I was that popular. 515 friends. There are people that have way more friends on Facebook every day. Not every day, but many days, Facebook will tell me, hey, you might know this person. You should become friends with them. Or I'll get friend requests from various people. Some I don't even know who they are. Some are connected, especially now that I'm doing the global ministries thing and I've been to different countries. Now I've got people from other countries friending me on Facebook. So of those 515 friends, or however many you have, how many of them have you let's just say, messaged, sent an email to, a text message, a Facebook message, an instant message of some kind, a direct message, uh, commented on their picture, on Instagram, on wherever, all the social media ways you can do it. Of the amount of friends you have, how many of them have you done that with, let's say, in the last three months? How many of them have you done that with on a regular basis? Of all those friends, how many of them have you actually spoken to? Because the reality is this little thing, if I call a number, I press a bunch of numbers and it gets somebody, I can actually talk, I can hear them, I can talk to them. How many of them have you done that with? Now, of course, we have to go back before COVID-19 when we could actually get together at a coffee shop or something like that. 
How many of those friends have you done that with? Sat down across from the table from them, shared a meal together, shared a drink together, and just chatted and just talked. I'm willing to bet, I know for me, it hasn't been anywhere close to 515. I don't even know if it's been 20. It's very few. And yet Facebook tells me I have all of these friends. And part of the reason why I wanted to talk about this idea of theology of friendship is because I think we have a very low view of what friendship really is and what it can mean for us in our lives and what is required of us being a friend. What's required of me to be a friend? Because we are, no under, we are under no obligation to be anyone's friend. You don't have to be somebody's friend, and they don't have to be my friend. It's, a, it's really a choice. There's no duty that says we have to do it. And I'll give you a quote from C.S. Lewis who says something about that. I've been reading his book called The Four Loves. In that book called The Four Loves, he has one of the chapters devoted to friendship and this idea of love within friendship. And he makes a statement about friendship and how we, we don't actually need it to survive. But I think what we'll see, I think what Scripture tells us is how valuable and important these friendships are. So I want to highlight first... Genesis chapter 2, I'll read verse 18, and then I'll read uh, chapter 3, verse 8. Obviously, we know this is the origins. This is God said, and it was good, and we have creation in here. Of course, the creation of uh, male and female, the creation of human beings, and we have this information about where we started from, and as I said, I talked about this when we did the family project because of this idea of relationship. So God creates humankind, and in verse 18, God had created Adam, and in verse 18 it says this of chapter 2, The Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. So Scripture tells us God said it's not good to be alone. We've just been hearing about God saying X and it being good. God is creating this ideal situation, this ideal creation. God speaks and it is good. But now we see that God created man, but He notices that it's not good for Him to be alone. He, he recognizes this less than ideal situation. And as I said during the family project, and I'll just remind us of that because maybe a couple of you have forgotten, is that in the Bible because we're actually hearing about God, like we're, we're listening into God's mind, and he's, he's created mankind. He's like, oh, man, this is great. Wait a second. You know what? This isn't as good as I originally thought it was because there's nobody with him. So man, I just, I messed up. I better do something about this. Why don't I create somebody to be in relationship with him? I don't think that's what Scripture is telling us. I think that is in Scripture for our benefit, not that we're figuring out how God is going along and He created and He's like, "Uh uh-oh, I didn't make the ideal situation. I think Scripture is highlighting for us, underscoring for us, that God creates human beings to be in relationship. That is the natural state of our origin, origins, of our creation. From the beginning, the created order of all things, God is telling us you are made to be in relationship. Now, in the Family Project, we, I use that to highlight this unique relationship in all of creation called marriage. But I don't think this lessens the degree to which God is emphasizing relationship, not just marriage, I think that's a unique one, but relationship in general. As we talked about when we were doing our Holy Spirit series, and we, we read in Genesis 1, 1 and chapter 1, verse 2, that the Holy Spirit was there in the beginning, hovering over the waters, and we talked about what that means. But God has been in relationship from the beginning. We talked about the Trinity, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and this relationship that they have always shared. And now God is creating into the fabric of the universe in which you and I inhabit 
the reality that if we are going to flourish as humans, that our lives are made to be in relationship with others. And not everybody gets married. There's been lots of single people. Jesus was single. Paul was single. These Jesus, the Messiah, and of course, Paul, the greatest missionary to the Gentile world, were both single. Did they lack something? Did Jesus lack something in this life because he wasn't married? I'm going to suggest to you, no, that he didn't, because Jesus was able to experience the intimacy of relationship that God is describing here that doesn't necessarily mean sexual intimacy. I know that's what we think in our minds here, in our culture, in the context of the United States. Whenever we say the word intimacy, we automatically assume, well, that must mean sexual intimacy. This idea of love already goes into, we conflate these two ideas of love into erotic love and love as friends, and that must mean if we're intimate with someone that we're having sex with them. And that's not what God is saying here in terms of the kind of relationship we can experience and the kind of relationship God desires to have with humanity. So God tells us from the beginning, God's not figuring this out, oh, you know what, this isn't an ideal situation for Adam. God is telling us from the beginning that Built into the fabric of our origins, of this universe, we are made to be with others, to be in relationship. And of course, if you turn the page one more to chapter 3, we see this alienation from this relationship where Adam and Eve sin. We call that the fall of mankind. But Adam and Eve are now alienated from this ideal situation of this relationship with God. And the language that is being used in chapter 3, verse 8, after they've eaten the apple, or the piece of fruit, whatever it was, then the man and his wife, verse 8, then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to them, where are you? So the language the author of Genesis is giving us here in chapter 3, verse 8, is this language and this idea of relationship. The Lord walked in the garden, whatever that means, because He's trying to convey in ancient Near Eastern culture and in the Old Testament, we see that language being used when these people are in relationship with God. And that's the idea that the author of Genesis is trying to give us in terms of this relationship Adam and Eve shared with God. We hear that of Enoch. Enoch walked with God. And he was one of the guys that didn't die. He walked with God, and God took him up. Abraham walked with God. Moses walked with... That's the language that is used of these individuals we see having this close relationship with God. And in fact, with Abraham... In the book of Chronicles, in the book of Isaiah, in the book of James, Abraham is identified as a friend of God. Now, this idea of friendship with God is very different than all the other ideas of gods and how, we, how human beings are related to gods in the ancient Near Eastern world. From the outset of the Scriptures that we have, it is clear that God desired to be in relationship with His people. And that's what was so horrible about what happened in the fall. We are broken people. I don't have to convince you of that. All you got to do today, you could turn on your TV and you can see how broken we truly are. How we alienate ourselves from others by not being in relationship with them and we call them the other. And I don't want to be friends with that person And you can list the reasons of why you don't want to be. From the outset of creation, God made us to be in relationship with Him and in relationship with each other. And when that breaks down, we see the horrible effects that can happen because we begin to dehumanize one another. You don't dehumanize your friend. And yet God in Scripture is saying that is His desire, is to be in relationship with us. So this idea of friendship 
is very different in the Scriptures compared to what the ancient Near Eastern world experienced. You didn't relate to the gods as friends. You were terrified of the gods. You did things to appease the gods. You know, the sacrificial system was not unique to Israel. All over the globe, that is just how people related to the gods. They sacrificed to them to appease them. Many, this relationship between the humanity and the gods, humans in most of the ancient Near Eastern world culture were here to serve the gods. You were a servant of the gods. And all throughout the Old Testament, all throughout the New Testament, we see our God serving us, even sending His own Son to die for us. That is unheard of in ancient ancient Near Eastern world, in any religion. To have God come and bear the flesh of humanity and die for them. You didn't relate to the gods that way. The gods were to be feared. The gods were to be appeased. The gods could be manipulated and bribed. That's why in the Old Testament we read about, I cannot, God says, Yahweh cannot be bribed. Because that was just something you did to the gods. Because if you bribed them, you got on their good side, hey, you might have a good crop. You might have a big family. Things might go well for you. You didn't relate to the gods as a friend. And yet the the man, the family that all Israel points back to, Abraham, was called a friend of God. Why? Why is that so important? And I think the theology of that is because God has crafted us, made us, formed us for relationship with Him and for relationship and in relationship with others. That's why, to me, this whole social distancing thing, you not being here with me now, is is hard. It's difficult. I can't stand it. I don't like it at all. And I want to get back together because Zoom is great. This is, this is great. Being able to call somebody is great. It's just not the same. It's not the same as sitting down and hanging out with somebody. It's not the same as you sitting here and being with each other. It's not the same as being able to go to somebody's house and have a meal, go out to that coffee shop and get a cup of coffee. It's just not the same. I can't have that kind of relationship with 515 friends on Facebook. It just doesn't work. And it can never be replaced. I think maybe you've maybe you felt that. I did. I won't speak for you. Maybe you felt that, that all the Zoom stuff we do just is not the same as being together. And I remember from being in the Navy and being out at sea and being able to email and going into port and making a phone call. That was all wonderful. It just wasn't the same as being able to go home and see my family and friends, being able to uh, sit down and have Christmas meal together and, and do those things together in relationship. It's just not the same, and it doesn't feel right because I was created to be in relationship with others. And so Jesus, as we move on to what Jesus said, and as I said, why I even kind of thought about this theme of, of friendship and the theology of friendship, Jesus was walking around with His disciples, God in flesh, dwelled among us, and Jesus, there were the crowds, and we'll, we'll talk about this in a different sermon. Jesus didn't have the same relationship with the crowds that He did with the twelve. He was a lot closer to the twelve than He was, of course, with these crowds that were gathering. And even within that twelve, Jesus had three, Peter, James, and John, that seemed to have even a closer relationship with Jesus. And even of those three, it seems that Jesus had an even closer relationship with Peter. These are ideas of friendship, and and Jesus calls His disciples friends. And that means something. In John 15, 15, Jesus is giving His his discourse now. We're getting closer to the crucifixion. Uh, John, we, we talked about this in the, the message series in John. John 12, Jesus is headed towards Jerusalem. And from John 12 to the time of His uh, arrest and crucifixion, it's really a series of conversations that He has with His disciples. The crowds are gone, and now it's just Him and those 12 guys. And Jesus is talking to them about the kingdom, about what's going to happen to Him. And so they're all together. 
Jesus washes their feet. We have that story. And Jesus is talking about the vine and the branches of them remaining in him and he remaining in them. And in John 15, 15, it says, I no longer call you servants. And that word servant in the Greek is doulos, and it can actually be translated slave as well. NIV translates it as servants, because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from the Father, I have made known to you. And so in that statement, there's, there's a lot there that we don't get because we didn't live in Jesus' culture. But in Jesus' world in the first century, in, in ancient Near Eastern culture, friendship had certain ideas connected to it. And one of those ideas was intimacy and the idea that you would share your life with this other person. And the Hebrew word for friend actually has this idea of secret, meaning there would be no secrets between you. This ancient concept of friendship had three distinct markers, one of them being loyalty, sometimes to the death. And that's what Peter said. Even if I have to die, Jesus, we'll go with you. Peter was willing to die for Jesus because they were friends. He, you know, he didn't get it exactly what Jesus was going to do, but the twelve knew when they made that trip to Jerusalem, Jesus was a wanted man. And if you were with him, and if you ate together, that was considered very close friendship, you were going to be implicated with Jesus. And so the twelve went willing to go to the death with Jesus, or at least they said they were, and then they scattered when Jesus was arrested. But loyalty, sometimes even to the death, was a big part of the ancient concept of friendship. Equality and mutual sharing of everything. These guys, these 12 guys, shared their lives together. And this idea of friendship, you were willing to do that. What's mine is yours. That was the idea. What's mine is yours. And as friends, that wasn't a big deal. There was an equality within that friendship. You weren't superior and your friend inferior. There were those relationships as the, the power and the servant. You know, you were the one in charge, the master and the servant. That's what Jesus says. I no longer call you servants. Because even this idea of loyalty, maybe he was a good master. There were plenty of those. And you, you served this good master and you as a servant, you still, the master didn't share all of his business with you. And Jesus says, everything the Father has revealed to me I'm revealing to you because you aren't servants, you're my friends, and I'm not keeping anything from you. There was this idea of equality, that Jesus was, was equal with, he's not saying I'm superior to you, even, I've not come to be served but to serve, that's what Jesus said. And so as friends, that's the idea in the ancient world, that's the concept of equality and mutual sharing. And again, this idea of intimacy, there's no secret secrets between us, full disclosure. And that doesn't mean sexual intimacy. You can have an intimate, deep relationship with a person that is not sexual. And we've lost that idea in our culture to our own detriment because there's a lot of people that don't necessarily have too many close friends. One of the things I've said multiple times in here and to you in, in messages, probably you've read it, seen it other places, is this problem we have with loneliness. And specifically with males and lots of young males. The number one issue they say they're facing is loneliness. They feel lonely. Because they don't have this concept of deep friendships. They think, I need to have this deep relationship with this female that turns into a sexual relationship. But as we'll see, and I'll highlight that with Jonathan and David, this idea of intimacy, full disclosure, this deep interconnectedness in relationship can happen between two males and two females, and it doesn't have to be sexual. The Scriptures are not describing homosexual relationships between this male and this female. It's describing this intimacy that, that is there, that exists because of this love for one another. This idea that you can know me as a friend. I heard something on 
uh, podcast I was listening to about friends and through this whole COVID-19 thing, people reconnecting with friends, friends they haven't talked to in a while. You know, you got time in your hands. Everybody's using uh, social media or Zoom or whatever to, to see each other, and, and they've been connecting with some old friends. And he made, this one guy made a comment about having friends or lack thereof, and it was a man, and he said about all of his friends are basically his wife's husbands, that his friendships exist because his wife has friends, and they happen to be married, and so now he has some friends. But should they leave, it's not like he's connected to them, it's kind of just like a companionship or a relationship out of convenience. Hey, I'm getting together with my friend, honey. You want to come along? Sure. Oh, you got a husband too? Great. We can sit and talk and chat. But what he was saying is he didn't really have any of those close relationships. Companionship and friendship are not the same thing. Being a part of maybe a, uh, a hunting camp I'm a part of, or maybe a, a gun club, maybe you're part of some kind of uh, Lions club or uh, the PTA or some social uh, club or something like that. And there's lots of people you know. But would you describe that relationship the way that the ancient New Eastern world described friendship? Do you have those kinds of friends in your life? We are super connected today. How is it possible that we are as lonely as we are the number one nation that experiences depression and anxiety due to loneliness? You know, we, we, when we're raising our children, and I've heard this said lots of times, and maybe you have a single child, and I hear parents say, we put them in daycare or preschool because we want them to socialize. We want them to be around other kids because in our minds, we think it's good for them to not just be alone, to be around others. And it is good. It's because how we're made. People who deal with depression, one of the, the issues of depression is you don't want to be around people. You begin closing off those relationships in your life. And if you go to any type of counselor, you, can, you know that that is the last thing you should do, is to close yourself off to relationships. That's why we encourage people to go to counseling and talk to another human being about what's going on in their lives. And that counselor is probably going to say, do you have anybody that you can confide in? Do you have any friends that are not just out of convenience or companionship, but you can, full disclosure, bear your soul, that's the idea, bear your soul to that person. Apparently, in the United States of America, we have a lot of people that don't have that. Friendship is extremely important to our lives. Here's a quote I told you that C.S. Lewis said, friendship is the least biological of our loves. Both the individual and the community can survive without it. Now, he's making a point here about the importance of friendship. I'll quote that the next slide. But right now, C.S. Lewis makes a point in his book, The Four Loves, that you can survive without friendship. There's lots of people apparently still surviving without friendship. It's not like you're going to wither and die because you don't have friends. Lewis is saying it's the least biological of the loves. It's something we don't need. If we're going to have love, you can, animals breed. They have sex to continue the species. We do that too. And there's lots of people that have been married for 20 years, 25 years, 30 years, that have had children, but after 25 years of marriage, they get divorced. After 30 years of marriage, people are getting divorced. Why? I'm going to suggest to you it's because they haven't been friends. Their relationship was based completely on trying to rear children and sexual intimacy. And Lewis is saying, while we don't need friendship to survive, it's crucial that we have it in our relationships. Friendship is the least biological of our loves. Both the individual and the community can survive without it. And I would suggest to you that's what people are doing. They are simply surviving. And when God said it's not good for him to be alone, he, he was 
highlighting a less than ideal situation. And if you feel alone in your life, it is not good that you feel alone. You need to be in relationship with others. You need friends. You need a community of people. David experienced this idea of friendship with Jonathan in 1 Samuel. And I'm just going to read 1 Samuel 18. Uh, You're going to have to read the whole story, 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel. But David had just kicked butt with Goliath, and Goliath is dead, laying on the ground, and now he's this amazing dude. And and Saul, who is king, has a son, and his name is Jonathan. And Jonathan recognizes something about David. And this relationship that would be very powerful in David's life and Jonathan's life begins in a very deep way in 1 Samuel chapter 18. It says, After David had finished talking with Saul, who was the king at the time, Jonathan the heir apparent, you know, Jonathan was the king's son, so when the king's dead, guess who's king? Jonathan. After David had finished talking with Saul, Jonathan became one in spirit with David. Now, different translations say different things there, but one translation say they became bound together, and he loved him as himself. From that day, Saul kept David with him and did not let him return return home to his family. And Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as himself. And Jonathan took off the robe he was wearing and gave it to David along with his tunic and even his sword and his bow and his belt." Jonathan basically was telling David, you're going to be the next king. And this idea, this, the language that is being used there is one of intimacy. And in the 70s, some new scholars began to read that, and they began to believe that David and Jonathan had some kind of homosexual relationship there because of the language that is being used. And David writes a poem in 2 Samuel. He writes a poem after Saul and Jonathan have been killed, and he's weeping and crying and lamenting the death of these people, and he talks about the love that he and Jonathan shared, being better than a woman's love. And now, lots of scholars debate about what that means and about what 1 Samuel 18 is saying, but if you understand the idea of friendship in the ancient Near Eastern culture you would know that that's not describing sexual intimacy. But unfortunately, within our own culture, anytime we use the word love, deep love, intimate love, we automatically attach sexual intimacy to it. That's not what they did in the ancient Near Eastern world. You could have this love, a love that is closer than a brother, the book of Proverbs says. And that's what David and Jonathan shared. And, John, and David was so broken by that, he wrote that poem in Second Samuel 2 when when Jonathan died. This idea of love in friendship, this full disclosure, bearing your soul to this other person does not require sexual intimacy. And in fact, we miss out on what friendship really is all about when we conflate these two ideas, which our culture does. Friendship means there's no secrets between us. Do you have a person in your life where there are no secrets between you, where you bear your soul to them. The best marriages are the ones where that spouse is their best friend because of the kind of relationship that is shared there. That's why people after 25 years of marriage get divorced. Love in the sense of friendship is full disclosure, and that can be a scary thing. Maybe you don't have friends because you're scared of what that means. You show people the real you, and maybe you're afraid of what they're going to think. True friendship allows that person to be real, authentic, and genuine. They don't have to pretend. They don't have to fake it. That's not a true friendship. And as friends, I show grace and love and all the things that Scripture says that we're supposed to show to one another, talking about the community of faith, this love and peace and patience and kindness and gentleness, all these things that we're supposed to bear with one another, that same idea attaches to friendship as well. But friendship can be a scary thing because people are going to discover 
the real you. But true, intimate friendship allows yourself to be discovered. That's what God is doing in us. I'm, I'm trying to be the real me with God. I, I don't believe, and I tell people this, you have to fake it with God. If you come to church, if you do the Christian thing so that people think you're that or so that maybe God's not going to see what's really in your mind and your heart, you don't need to do that. Because God can see it anyway. We're not fooling anybody. But true friends, you don't have to do that with either. With true friends, real friends, you can be authentic and you can open yourself and bear your soul to one another. One of the best pieces of advice I got in my pastoral counseling course was about friendship and being married. Most often, when we get married, that marriage, before it became a romantic relationship, started as a friendship. Even if you, the pursuer, wanted more than friendship, you at least had to start there at friendship. And if it doesn't continue, if that friendship doesn't continue, the relationship's going to start to separate. And my, my uh, professor in my pastoral counseling course said, people stop being friends long before they get divorced. If you want to rekindle this marriage, you've got to learn how to become friends again. And I've used that line a lot. And maybe I've even said that to you in your marriage here at Grace Church because I believe that it's true. Because of how deep this friendship is and how life-fulfilling and sustaining it is. And I agree with my professor who's done countless hours of marriage counseling and counseled, counseled countless people and tries to help them learn how to be friends so they can restore the marriage. So I'm going to give you the C.S. Lewis quote that he ends that chapter with that I'm, or that section that I read for you before about, you know, friendship being the least biological of loves. We can survive without it. And this is what he says later. It has no survival value. Friendship, we just heard that. It has no survival value. Rather, it is one of those things that give value to survival. It is one, friendship is one of those things that gives value to this world and to this life. If you want to experience human flourishing the way God intends human beings to, to experience it, we need deep, close, intimate friends. And so as we go through this series, if you're somebody that has felt lonely, I encourage you to seek out this kind of friendship and be willing to open yourself and let people discover the real you. I mean, that's one of the things that we talk about here at Grace Church. That's the whole reason I wanted to start life groups. Because I don't need, I don't want a bunch of superficial relationships. It does nothing for us. But when we do life together, we experience relationships that actually don't make this thing that we're going through that we call life simply about survival. It's about thriving. It's about flourishing. It's about experiencing all this life has to offer. And the best way we can do that is within friendships. And that's why every fall we start life groups again because I believe that in these smaller, closer relationships, you can experience what God intends, what we see happening throughout Scripture. And the theology of all this is that's how we were made. It's built into the fabric of this, universe, of this universe. And when we don't experience that, I'm going to suggest to you, you get what we're watching right now. When we can't sit down and be friends, and you and I can't have a disagreement and come from two completely different sides on an issue without throwing rocks at each other, we've lost this idea of what it means to live in community as friends, still disagreeing, but still being friends, still being able to bear my soul to this other person and know I'm not going to be judged for it, know I'm going to have grace shown to me. Even hurting this person and being able to forgive that friend. 
So this next series, the next three Sundays, we're going to be talking about friendship and what it means and how it can be a remedy to our issues of loneliness, to the issues, I think, facing our culture right now. Let's pray. God, thank You for this love that we get to experience in friendship. The examples that we see throughout Scripture, even Jonathan saying he loved David as himself and David reciprocating that, and this idea of this close friendship, this close bond between two people. God, You made us that way, and when we live that out, we flourish as humans. God, I pray that we can experience that. We can experience those deep friendships within our church. I pray that we could experience those in our lives, Lord God. If there's somebody that's lacking that, Lord, I pray that you would bring people closer to them, that they would put themselves out there to have those kinds of friendships, Lord. God, this, this idea of friendship is a gift that I think we've lost in our culture I don't have 515 friends, and I don't need that many friends because I do have some friends that I can do this with, Lord, and I'm so thankful that I do. And God, I pray that as we go through this message series, that you would deepen our bonds with the friends that we already have, and that you would strengthen this idea of relationship, of community, of friendship as a remedy to the things that are ailing us in our culture today. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.